Okay, guys, our next story is the Scarlet Ibis. I'm not going to lie, it's kind of a sad one, but it's a really good story. It's very well written. So, what we are going to do is I'll probably have to do this in a couple of parts because it just makes it easier to upload to YouTube. Like, it doesn't take an hour per video to upload. So, let's start by reading. I'll read for about probably 10 or 15 minutes. We'll stop. I'll uh, make another video of us continuing. Okay, here we go. The Scarlet Ibis by James Hurst. It was in the clove of seasons. Summer was dead, but autumn had not yet been born, that the ibis lit in the bleeding tree. The flower garden was stained with rotting brown magnolia petals and ironweeds grew rank amid the uh, purple phlox. The five o'clocks by the chimney still marked time. The five o'clocks, yeah, by the chimney still marked the time. But the oriole nest in the elm was untenated and rocked back and forth like an empty cradle. The last graveyard flowers were blooming, and their smell drifted across the cotton field and through every room of our house, speaking softly the names of our dead. Dead, sad, empty, depressed. It's strange that all this is so clear to me now, now that the summer has long since fled and time has had its way. A grindstone stands where the bleeding tree stood, <clears throat> just outside the kitchen door. Now, if an oriole sings in the elms, its song seems to die up in the, heat, in the leaves, a silvery dust. The flower garden is prim, the house is gleaming white, and the pale fence across the yard stands straight and spruce. But sometimes, like right now, as I sit in the cool green draped parlor, the grindstone begins to turn. And time, with all its changes, is ground away. And I remember Doodle. Something is... I remember Doodle. Doodle was just about the craziest boy, uh, brother, or craziest brother a boy ever had. Of course, he wasn't crazy crazy like old Miss Leedy, who was in love with President Wilson and wrote him a letter every day, but was a nice crazy, like someone you'd meet in your dreams. He was born when I was six and was, from the onset, a disappointment. Everybody thought he was going to die, everybody except for Aunt Nisi, who had delivered him. She said he would live because he was born in a call and calls were made from Jesus' nightgown. Daddy had Mr. Heath, the carpenter, build a mahogany coffin for him, but he didn't die. And when he was three months old, Mama and Daddy decided that he might, they might as well name him. They named him William Armstrong, which is like a big tail on a small kite. Such a name sounds good only on a tombstone. So we are already finding out that when his brother was born, he was very, very sickly and nobody thought he would live. I thought myself pretty smart at many things, like holding my breath, running, jumping, and climbing the vines in Old Woman Swamp. I wanted more than anything else to race to Horsehead Landing, someone to box with and somebody perch in the, uh, with the fork of the, tr of the great pine behind the barn, when across the fields and swamps you could see the sea. I wanted a brother. But Mama, crying, told me that even if William Armstrong lived, he would never do those things with me. He might not, she sobbed, even be all there. He might, as long as he lived, lie on a rubber sheet in the center of the bed in the front bedroom where the uh, white marqueresque curtains billowed and the afternoon sea breeze rustling like palmetto fronds. It was bad enough having an invalid brother, but having one who possibly was not all there was unbearable. So I began to make plans to kill my brother by, or to kill him by smothering him with a pillow. However, one afternoon as I watched him, my head poked between the iron posts of the foot of the bed. He looked straight at me and grinned. Skipped through the rooms, down the echoing halls, shouting, Mama, he smiled. He's all there. He's all there. And he was. He was too. If you laid him on his stomach, he began to try to move himself, straining terribly. The doctor said that with his weak heart, the strain could, would probably kill him, but it didn't. Trembling, he pushed himself up, turning first red and then a soft purple, and finally collapsed back onto the bed like an old worn-out doll. I could still see Mama watching him, her hand pressed tight across her mouth, her eyes wide and unblinking. But he learned to crawl. It was his third winter, and we'd brought him out to the front of the front bedroom Putting him on the rug before the fireplace for the first time, he became one of us. 
As long as he lay all the time in bed, we called him William Armstrong, even though it was formal and sounded as if we were referring to one of our ancestors. But with his creeping around on the deerskin rug and beginning to talk, something had to be done about his name. It was I who renamed him. When he crawled, he crawled backwards, as if in reverse and couldn't change gears. If you called him, he turned around as if he was going in the other direction, and then he'd be right back up, or he'd be right up to you to be picked up. Crawling backward made him look like a doodle buck, so I began to call him Doodle. And in time, even Mama and Daddy thought it was a better name than William Armstrong. Only Aunt Niecy disagreed. She said call babies should not be treated with special respects since they might turn out to be saints. Renaming my brother was perhaps the kindest thing I ever did for him because nobody expects much from somebody called Doodle. Although Doodle learned to crawl, he showed no signs of walking, but he wasn't idle. He talked so much that we all quit listening to what he said. It was about this time that Dad, Daddy built him a go-kart, and I had to pull him around. At first, I just paraded him up and down the piazza, but then he started crying to be taken out into the yard, and it ended up, and it ended up by my having to lug him wherever I went. If so much... If I so much as picked up my cap, he'd start crying to go out with me, and Mama would take or Mama would call from wherever she was, take Doodle with you. He was a burden in many ways. The doctor had said that he uh, mustn't get too excited, too hot, too cold, or too tired. They must always be treated gently. A long list of don'ts went with him, all of which I ignored once we got out of the house. To discourage his coming with me, I'd run him across the ends of the cotton rows and careen him around the corners on two wheels. Sometimes I accidentally turned him over, but he never told Mama. His skin was very sensitive, and he had to wear a big straw hat whenever we went out. When the going got rough and he had to cling to the sides of the cart, the hat slipped away and went down over his ears. He was a sight. Finally, I could see I was licked. Doodle was my brother, and he was going to cling to me forever, no matter what I did. So I dragged him across the burning cotton field to share with him the only, the only beauty I know, or knew, old woman's swamp. I pulled the golf cart through the sawtooth fern, down into the green dimness where the palmetto fronds whispered by the stream. I lifted him out and set him down on the soft rubber grass beside a tall pine. His eyes were round with wonder as he gazed about him, and his little hands began to stroke the rubber grass, and then he began to cry. Oh, for heaven's sake, what's the matter? I asked, annoyed. It's so pretty, he said. So pretty. 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 After that day, Doodle and I often went down to Old Woman's Swamp. I would gather wild flowers, wild violets, honeysuckle, yellow jasmine, snake flowers, and water lilies, and with wired grass we'd weave them into necklaces and crowns. We'd bedeck ourselves with our handiwork and lull about this beauty or about thus beautified beyond the touch of the everyday world. And then, when the slanted rays of the sun burned orange in the tops of the pines, we'd drop our jewels into the stream and watch them float away toward the sea. There is within me, and with sadness I have watched it in others, a knot of cruelty borne by the stream of love. Much as our blood sometimes bears the seed of destruction, and at times I was mean to doodle. One day I took him up to the barn loft and showed him his casket, telling him all how we all thought or had believed he would die. It was covered with a film of Paris green sprinkled with rods, or sprinkled to kill rats, and screech owls had built a nest inside. Doodle studied the mahogany box for a long time and said, It's not mine. It is, I said, and before I'll help you down from the loft, you're going to have to touch it. I won't touch it, he said sullenly. Then you'll leave here by yourself, I threatened, and made as if, and made as if I were going down. That is so mean. So his little brother, that he has to basically wheel around with him everywhere, because he's so disabled, he takes him up and shows him his casket that they were going to bury him when they thought he was going to die shortly after birth and was going to make him touch it. And I don't know if you guys have had big brothers, but I did. I had my big brother was five years older than me. And 
There, there were times where he was cruel. <laughs> but it's because we're young and we don't know any better. So let's keep going. Actually, let's stop right there and then we'll start back up here in a second.